All right, so it is right at 11.15, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. Everybody's everybody's doing good. Um, didn't have to battle traffic or anything. Good morning. All right, so we talked about regeneration on Wednesday as one way that we can increase the thermal efficiency of the Brayton cycle. Good morning, everybody. Um, so regeneration would decrease the amount of QN that we had to add to the cycle, which translates to fuel savings. Um, but now we're going to talk about reheating and intercooling. Sorry about the numbering here. I know I started with number three and now I'm going to option one and two, but, um, but our other two options are increasing the work net output of the cycle. So increasing the numerator of that thermal efficiency equation. Um, and so we can mess with either the work out, try to increase that or decrease the amount of work in that we have to put into the cycle. Um, so in order to increase the work output for the expansion process, what we'll do is we'll use what's called reheating. And I know it's a little bit, a little bit fuzzy here, but what I'm looking at is this little section right here. Um, so instead of expanding from you know, one pressure to another pressure in one fail swoop. Is that, I, I feel like I'm making up a word there, it, but in one step, we're going to divide it up into two steps. We could divide it into more than two steps, but we're going to divide it up into two steps. So the numbering that they've got on here um, is oddly, but it's three, four, because they're trying to indicate that, you know, instead of going from three to four in one step, we're dividing it up. And our first expansion goes to pressure A, and then we have this reheat combustor. So it's a combustion process, but once again, we're modeling, we're modeling this as a heat addition process, a uh, simple heat addition process. So there's your, I'm going to write it in red, Q dot N. And then of course your pressure PA and PB would be the same, um, but your pressure P4 would be less than P3, right? So your pressure goes down from 3 to A, stays the same A to B, and then goes down again from B to A. So the idea of, or the reason that we do this is to um, decrease, or I'm sorry, to increase the amount of work that we get out of this process. So there is a, the video on reheating and intercooling talks about this, but if you recall um, the equation for steady flow reversible work, uh, so this was back in, in Thermo 1, sort of at the end of Thermo 1, uh, but this is the equation for that. Now we might not necessarily have, we may have like an isotropic efficiency of less than one. Um, so we do might have the irreversibilities that we do consider, but the general concept remains the same. Given a, a given pressure difference, if we can keep this guy high, this elevated, then the work that we get out of this will be will be high as well. Don't worry too much about the negative there. Just keep in mind we're using sign conventions. Whatever whatever number we calculate, it's going to be a positive num number. So you're looking at the absolute value of this. So you want it to be big. Um, and so keep that specific volume high by keeping the temperature high. Right? It's all related because we got this ideal gas. Right? R T equals P V keep the temperature high, you keep the specific volume high, and you do that by adding heat between each expansion stage. Same kind of ideal for intercooling. So this is intercooling. So here we're, we're removing heat in between two compression stages. So instead of um, compressing from state one to state two to from P1 to P2 in just one step, we're going to do it in two steps. So you're going to compress from P1 to, they're calling it P, oops, C and D. 
so in this case, you know, there's no pressure drop from C to D, so PC and PD are the same. And that intercooler is just a heat exchanger in which we're rejecting heat, and that's our Q dot out there. And it's the same kind of idea. We're going to minimize the amount of work that we have to put into this, right? Here's, here's a work in, but we also have a work in here. And the overall reversible steady flow work, we keep this low. keep um, that work input low, right? The work input required um, from P1 to P2. That's the general idea. Okay. And we will work a problem uh, where we actually compare just looking at, say, I, I think it's, we look at reheating and we kind of show, let's, let's calculate um, the work output that we would get if we expanded in one stage as opposed to two, and we kind of proved to ourselves why that works. Okay. So a good conceptual question for me to ask is, you know, um, what is the effect of, let's talk about that. It's the effect of uh, reheat. And the effect of that is that we um, increase work output. Um, the effect of intercooling is going to be decreasing the work input that we'd get or that we'd have to provide. So that's intercooling, that's multi stage. Uh, compression with intercooling um, and then of course we can kind of throw back to what we talked about on Wednesday the effect of regeneration is that we would decrease the amount of heat that we have to put into the cycle so if a problem you know if you had a conceptual problem that asked you for example and I'm sorry my head's in the way like the head's too big let's make it not so big much better much better there we go yeah sorry about that sorry about that krista yeah <laughs> all right but anyway if we if i asked you if i asked you a conceptual question about regeneration and I said, uh, what is the effect of regeneration on the work output? Your answer would be, it doesn't have an effect on the work output. It has effect on the Q input. Okay, so now let's work a problem. We've got an ideal cold air standard Brayton cycle, and we've got reheat and uh, intercooling. Um, we've got some stuff given to us. So, all right, so I'm given the pressure ratios across each of those compressors and the uh, pressure ratio across each of the turbines. We're given some temperatures um, and we want to find the back work ratio and the thermal efficiency. So when you have a problem like this, um, if I were to give you this on an exam, that figure right there is exactly what I would give you. Um, and it would be up to you to translate um, or to, to figure out, okay, well, I have these heat exchangers. Is there a Q in? Is it a Q in? Is it a Q out? Um, Where's the work in, work out, right? That would be up to you because that wouldn't be given to you. Let's kind of go through it. So from one to two, there's your work in. You've also got another one from three to four. You've got two work ins. And then of course you've got work out first turbine and a workout second turbine. Okay. Um, so you can see the compressors, the inlet is going in at the, the fat end and then it's going out at the skinny end, indicating that it's being compressed. 
that was handle the the uh, heat exchanger. So from two to three, so that little that heat exchanger between that compression, uh, those two compressors, the point of either reheat or intercooling is to counteract what's going on. Okay, so for the compression process you're increasing the pressure and the temperature is going down but you you don't want that to happen you want to keep that temperature low and so it's right here it's going to be a you out and then you finish compressing it from three to four then from four to five this is where you're modeling uh your your combustion process and you're modeling it as just a simple heat addition process. And then you've got your expansion, first stage of expansion from five to six. So as your pressure goes down, the temperature goes down, but you want to counteract that. And so you're going to add heat between six and seven to keep that temperature up in order to keep the specific volume up in order to keep the overall work output high. So this is a Q in. And then seven to eight, you finish expanding it all the way to the final pressure eight. And then from eight to one, that's that imaginary heat exchanger. That's where you're modeling the exhaust process. So there's not a physical heat exchanger there. It's an imaginary one, but it's, it's part of our model of the actual gas turbine engine with intercooled. Okay. So... I've drawn all my QNs and QOuts. I could put my temperatures on there, but it's fine. There's not too much there, so I'll just leave it as it is. Um, I will need to probably assume some things and also spell assume correctly. All right, so keep in mind what your first law is. And this is the first law applied to an open system. It's QN minus QOut. minus minus work out minus work in equals delta h and of course there's a delta kinetic and delta potential energy change that get uh that uh were assumed to be nope i'm good i'm good i've already done it That are assumed to be zero so delta kinetic energy delta potential energy both of those guys are zero um and then also we had to assume that it's steady state in order to get um that first law in that particular form up at the upper right hand corner so here we go get our solution here so first things first, I want to get my governing equation. Um, I do note that they say it's an ideal cold air standard. So, you know, I could throw something on there like ideal. What does that mean? That means that the isentropic efficiency of each of those compressors are one. So one and two isentropic efficiency of the turbines, one and two each of those oops not zero it's one but it also tells me where the pressures are equal to one another so i don't have any pressure drops from two to three i don't have a pressure drop from four to five right just across the heat exchangers across the piping so p6 seven and then P8 and P1 are equal to one another. Okay, perfect. And then we said cold air. That just means that K is equal to one. Okay, now I'm ready. Now I'm ready to get my governing equation. So the back work ratio, and it uh, back work ratio is defined on your equation sheet. 
um, but it's going to be the work of the compressors over the work of the turbines. Um, and we have multiple of each, so we just need to make sure. The tiny subscripts, great question. Are you talking about in the, ah, uh, these guys right here? Yeah, it was sort of a, I was like, you talking about those, probably. So, I'm saying that the isentropic efficiency of each of those compressors and the isentropic efficiency of each of those turbines are just one. Yeah. All right, so now we got the back work ratio. So, E, W, R. So by definition, this would be the work of the compressor. It's compressor one and two, because I've got two of them, over the work of turbines. One and two. I guess I've got two of them once again. And of course, I'm making ID, I'm making cold air standard assumptions. So any of those delta H's are CP delta T's. So for the turbine, well, each of those is going to be a work input. So it's going to be the work in for each of those guys is going to be a negative CP delta T. Um, right? Oh, I'm sorry. No, the two negatives cancel out, right? Or, you know negate each other, so I'm sorry, it is just CP delta T. It's a positive term, so what it is after mine is what it is before. So I have, for the first one, got T2 minus T1. Also got CP T4. It's T3, that's for the second one. And then for the turbines, those are between five and six and seven and eight. And if I applied my first law, of course, that's where I get my negative, my work out would be the negative CP delta T. So it'll be what it is before minus what it is after when that negative gets distributed. So it'll be CP times five, T5 minus T6. And CP T7 minus T8. All right, perfect. So there's my governing equation there. And then I need my thermal efficiency. So I know it's the work net out over N. And by work net out, I can write it two different. I can write this thermal efficiency equation two different ways, and I might as well do that. Let's make sure that we can all see that. Um, so it'd be the work, any work out. T5 minus T6, so for the turbines. And then the compressors. Of course, I know that CP is going to cancel out, but I like to have him there. Um, and then my Q in, it looks like I've actually got two of those. I've got one between four and five, and another one between six and seven for the reheat combustor. So, bottom, I'll have CP times T5 minus T4. You can apply that first law, figure out what your QN will be. Is it CP delta T or negative CP delta T? Um, you could also just kind of reason that T5 is going to be bigger than T4 because it's going to be bigger after you add the heat than before it. Um, and then, and of course, you've also got one between six and seven. So this would be T7 minus T6. Or you could put it in terms of one minus Q out over Q in. So let's do that as well. And it won't matter which one you do. 
It should both be give you the exact same answer. And if it doesn't, then you know that you have um, a problem with one of the temperatures or something wrong with one of your formulas that you're using. Um, so this would be one minus see the denominator is going to be the same so it's going to be t5 minus t4 plus t7 minus t6 and of course I've, I do have a q out I've got two q outs one is for that intercooling process between the two compressors and the other one is where we're modeling the exhaust process between 8 and 1. This is cp times uh, so it'll be T2 minus T3 plus T8 minus T1. And I can kind of reason out. I can apply my first law, figure out is it T2 minus T3 or vice versa. Um, or I can reason out, well, T2 is going to be bigger than T3 because your temperature is going to be higher before you reject the heat rather than after. So I'm good there, right? Remember I've mentioned before, it's always a good idea to go ahead and calculate, make sure make sure that your work net out is equal to your Q net in and that's actually what you're doing here as well calculating that thermal efficiency both ways um but yeah make sure that's true if it's not then you probably have something screwy going on somewhere and you need to figure out what it is all right but now we're ready to go figure out our temperatures and i'm i'm good for t1 and i'm good for t3 and T5 and T7, so that's really just half of the temperatures there, so that's good. Um, but let's go ahead and figure out all these other temperatures. I think let's use this pretty blue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it up. So state one, like I said, I know what the temperature is. It's given to me. 300. And then state two. Note that we don't have to figure out a T2S and a T2 because, because our isentropic efficiency of that first guy is one. They didn't tell me what it was. Um, and it's something I sort of had to yeah, they didn't tell me what it was and so uh, but they did tell me that it's an ideal cycle and so that's one of the assumptions that kind of goes along with that is that um right those isentropic efficiencies are one because no heat transfer where you don't want it to happen so you wouldn't have it in the compressors um, and everything's reversible so adiabatic reversible isentropic all right so that just means i need to use one of my isentropic equations or isentropic uh, relationships for an ideal gas with constant specific heats so it's going to be t2 over t1 2 over p1 2 k minus 1 over k and it's just a matter of solving for t2 so I get a T2 of 410.625. State three is right after that intercooling process. So from one to two, we compressed it, the temperature went up, then we rejected heat and we're all the way back to 100 Kelvin. Now we're going to state B. So this is after the compression process in the second turbine. Um, and same kind of thing. 
I don't have to, oops, I know, it's not state three, it's state four. Um, I don't have to figure out a T4S because, well, I am going to figure out a T4S, but I don't have to figure out a different T4S and then T4 because the isentropic efficiency is one. So those two things are the same thing. Isentropic relationship for an isentropic process. And we're given these pressure ratios in our given statement. This is K minus one over K. And it should be no surprise that your T4 ends up being the exact same thing because you have same inlet condition and the same operating conditions, right? Same pressure ratio, same isentropic efficiency. So it shouldn't be a surprise that those two things are equal to one another. Okay. So. Oh, I'm running out of room. Huh. Well, that's fine. I'll make this smaller. There we go. Fit it all in there. All right. So, oopsies. All right. So, state five. Let's kind of go back to our. Oh, state five is actually what I know, isn't it? That's what's given to me because T5 is 1200 Kelvin. And I'm going to scroll up to my picture now so I don't forget what it looks like, what my diagram actually, or my picture actually looks at like. So T5 is going into that first uh, expansion stage, first turbine. And from five to six, we expand isentropically from 1200 Kelvin, something else. And then our pressure ratio, um, we're given P5 over P6. So P6 over P5 would be one over three. Right. And just kind of a note, same thing. T6 is equal to T6S. And that's just because the isentropic efficiency of that first turbine is one. There's a, you know, there's a good bit of repetition here, but like that's, I guess that's good and bad, right? We have the opportunity to like really, really get it. So K minus one over K. Um, so I end up calculating a T6 of 876.72 Kelvin. So we should kind of make sure, you know, sometimes it's a good idea to, to take a step back and see these numbers make sense, right? Is it going up where it needs to? Where is it going down where it needs to? Um, so, you know, from one to two, you'd expect the temperature to increase, and it does from 300 to 410 and change. Then from two to three, you would expect the temperature to go down, which it does from 410 and change to 300. Then from three to four, it's compressed. You'd expect it to go up, which it does to 410 and change. Four to five, you'd express, uh, expect it to go up. It does to 1200 Kelvin. And five to six, you would expect it to go down, which it does to 876. Um, and once again, I kind of skipped over, should have written that. This is equal to one over three. All right. State seven, which is the inlet to the next turbine, the second stage turbine, um, that's given to us T7 equal to T5, it's 1200 Kelvin. And so state eight is the second stage turbine. And so I can apply an isentropic relationship because once again, T8S, T8 are the same. So I don't have like two different things to calculate there. Um, but let's go with you. 8 over 7 is going to be equal to P8 
over P7 to the K minus one over K. And it will not be a surprise, or hopefully it's not a surprise that because both of those turbines have the exact same inlet conditions and the same operating conditions, same isentropic efficiency, same pressure ratio, the outlet temperature will be the same for each of those. So T8 is also 876, 872. Now that wouldn't be the case if I if the problem statement had said um, the first turbine stage has an isentropic efficiency of one or 100 percent. Second turbine stage has an isentropic efficiency of 75 percent. Well, in that case, your T8S would be the same as T6, but then you'd have to use the isentropic efficiency of the second turbine stage uh, to figure out what T8 was. Does anybody have any questions? So you are more than welcome. If you want to unmute yourself, you can ask questions, or if you're not comfortable with that, you could throw it in the chat at any time. And um, if, if you throw something in the chat and I don't see it, I try to look at it every now and then, but if I don't see it, um, somebody say something. <laughs> say, hey, did you see the question? Okay. All right, so I did plug in my numbers and you are welcome to interrupt me. I don't, I won't take offense but I don't want there to be dead air because I don't hear anything and I don't see you. So <laughs> I don't know if everybody's just bored or what. I'm gonna, oh yeah, I can. Uh, I have a quick question. I, uh, what is the, so like state four equaling state four S, what does the S represent again? It's the temperature after the ice, and, uh, after, yeah. So is it just, okay. So T4 is equal to T4 S. Why is that? It's because we said that the isentropic efficiency of this guy is one. And this is defined as the ratio of the two works. Um, so the work for the actual real world case and the work for the ideally isentropic case, which is never attainable in real life. So um, it's on your equation sheet, which one is on the top and which one is on the bottom. But for a compression process, it's a it's a work uh, consuming device, and ideally we don't have to put a lot of work into it. Um, so ideally, the ideal case is a small one, so WS over W, and this is CP. It's going to be CP delta T between three and four, um, and both of them is going to be T4 minus T3, T4 minus T3. But the only difference is on the top, this guy is a T4S because it would be the temperature at the end of that ideally isentropic process. Okay, so it's just kind of like assuming that it works perfectly. That's kind of what T4 equals T4S means. So what isentropic means is that it's adiabatic and reversible so what you said is not incorrect i'm just going a little bit more you know what do we mean by it works perfectly um so one of the assumptions with uh these cycles those ideal cycle assumptions is that you don't have you don't have heat transfer where you don't want it to occur and for a compression process and a um, for a compression process you want all the work all the, I'm sorry, all the energy that's crossing that system boundary, you want it all to be going in as work, not as heat transfer. So, yeah, so a compressor is gonna operate um, adiabatically, um, ideally. And if all the processes are reversible, right, that's the other thing, right? So, make a little note. Compressors, turbines are ideally adiabatic. It's like I said, the the only energy energy can cross the system boundary of an open system, which is what we have here in turn uh, as heat work 
or by mass flow. So we got mass flow that's just by definition, or, you know, that is what it is. Um, but we don't want anything to be crossing as heat transfer, only as work. Or only as usable work. Is that, is that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, and I do have some numbers here for the back work ratio. So for the back work ratio, I've got 34.2%. 34.2%, you'll calculate 0.34, obviously not 34.2. Um, and then my thermal efficiency, you'll get 0.382 or 38.2%. The happy little blue bubble around each of those. So we're, we're happy with what we got there. Okay. So I will kind of keep on going, but once again, feel completely free to interrupt me if you would like. All right, so problem seven. This is a case where they don't give us a diagram, but it's okay, we got this, no problem. So air enters the compressor of a regenerative cold air standard Brayton cycle with a volumetric flow rate of 60 meters cubed per second. Um, and then we've got the pressure and temperature. We got a compressor ratio. Um, so just kind of looking at all at the you know, what's written here. I know we have regeneration, so it's it's a Brayton cycle with regeneration. I guess it says so right there: regenerative cold air Brayton cycle. So I remember what that looks like. Um, I will tell you that on your exam. And I've said this before, but on your exam, the only, I, I will give you a diagram. Uh, I, like for this problem, I would give you a diagram. The only thing I wouldn't give you, um, I, I wouldn't give you like what the, where the Q ins and Q outs are, but I would give you what I'm going to draw right here. It looked like the one in the previous problem. Yes, in that the diagram, that would be the diagram. Um, but it might not say P2 over P1 is equal to this. It might have the text of the problem, like right here for problem seven, and it would be up to you to figure out where do those go. So let me just, I'm going to, I'm going to draw the, the cycle. And then I'll iterate exactly what it might look like on a test. Here's my regenerator. So here's... Yeah, if I gave you this problem on a test, honestly, probably what I would do is give you that. And I would put some numbers on here. One to two to three to four five to six. And then I would give you the text of this problem and it would be up to you to figure out, okay, where does that 60 meters cubed per second go? And what is that? And what it is, is a volumetric flow rate. So it's entering the compressor dot one entering at six meters cubed per second a pressure p1 of 0 0.8 bar and then t1 180 kelvin the compressor pressure ratio that's p2 over p1 going to be 20 and then the maximum cycle temperature is 2100 kelvin so i can kind of reason out where is the highest temperature going to be well from one to two the temperature is going to go up because we're it's a compression process and then i recognize or well yeah this guy right here this box this is my regenerator and the whole point of that regenerator is to transfer heat right 
where it would have been wasted leaving in the exhaust. No, I want to I want to redirect some of that heat back into cycle. This is Q gin. Um, so keep the temperature is going to go up from two to three. And then here's my combustor or I'm modeling that combustion process as a simple heat addition process. So from three to four, I've got the uh, temperature goes up even more. Then from four to one, it's an, it's an expansion process. So the process, so the temperature goes down from five to six, I lose heat or not lose heat, but I transfer heat um, away from the work from the air. Um, and so my temperature would go down again. And so the highest temperature in this cycle is clearly it's at state four. So this is my highest temperature. We said it was 2100 Kelvin. For the compressor, the isentropic efficiency is 92% and the turbine, it's 95%. So. Okay. And then we have a regenerator effectiveness. I'm going to put that up here as well. 0 0.85. So this is... Some people might be in heat transfer at this point. Um, so this is... We'll talk sort of probably at the end of the semester about just heat exchanger effectiveness. That's what this is. Regenerator effectiveness. It's just a heat exchanger effectiveness. Um, and then we want to find the net power output, net power developed in megawatts, the thermal efficiency, and the rate of heat addition in the combustor. So, all right. So I'm going to call those are three things. So A, B, C. And I know we're running short on time. Um, yeah, I know we're running short on time. I know we've got... Uh, what eight minutes left a little less than eight minutes but we'll probably set up the problem and then we'll come back to it on Wednesday of next week because we don't have class on Monday um, we want to find the net power output developed so that is W dot net out want this guy in megawatts want the thermal efficiency and we also want the rate of heat addition combustor. So that's Q dot N. And the assumptions are going to be very similar to what we've done in the past. Um, for these other problems, changes in kinetic and potential energy are zero. And then everything's operating at steady state. Um, I'll say something along the lines. Uh, so, uh, there was a question about how long the YouTube video will be available. Um, so I have it currently set, I think, to populate on the Thermo 2 Unit 1 playlist. Um, but if you have issues accessing it, just let me know. Okay. All right. And I, I don't plan on taking it, taking it down or anything before the end of the semester. All right, but it is ideal, except that the isentropic efficiency of the compressor and the turbine are less than one. Um, but what that means is, let's see, where my pressures are equal to one another. So don't have any pressure drops where I don't want them to occur. So P2, P3, P4 are all the same. And then P5 and P6 and if i sort of remember that this is i'm modeling it as a cycle and while there is not a physical heat exchanger out here i'm going to pretend that there is and this is where i'm modeling that exhaust process so it's my it's a q dot out or a little q out i guess is what i'm using um but I kind of close that loop then that just means that p6 and p1 are the same okay 
So let's go ahead and at least get our governing equation for that first one. And then the rest maybe we won't be able to get to today, but it'll be okay. So w dot net out. Well, I got to pay attention to the fact that it's a rate term. So I'm going to be multiplying by an M dot and then my little work net out. Um, oh, that's good. And of course, I know I've got a work in here. And I've got a work out here. And so it's going to be the work out minus the work in. Um, I get it and put cold air standard in my assumptions, but that is something I'm going to use. Yeah, it says cold air, so yeah, cold air. 1.4 is what I'm going to be using for K. Um, so everything's going to be in terms of CP delta T, but my M dot is probably something that I kind of got to think about. Um, so I know I know my volumetric flow rate. Um, so good idea would be maybe define that M dot in terms of V dot, and I'm going to define it where I know the V dot, right, which is at state one. That M dot is constant. Right, it's equal to m dot one, it's equal to m dot two, so on and so forth. Because it's just one big loop essentially. Right? I don't actually know what that specific volume is, however, I do have enough information to solve for it because it's an ideal cold air standard. It's cold air standard. So one of the assumptions that we make with cold air standard assumptions is that your working fluid is air and it behaves as an ideal gas. So you can always use the ideal gas law. It's always your friend um, as long as you have enough information there. Um, and we do at state one. So this is going to be, uh, so it's going to be R T1 over T1. And I have that information there. And then, of course, this is going to be V.1, which is given to me. And then my little work net out, it's going to be the work out, which occurs between 4 and 5. So CP. And this will be, what, T4 minus T5? Minus the work in, which will be CP times T2 minus T1. Right. And we got three minutes. Let's see if we can't knock out the thermal efficiency as well. So the thermal efficiency, you could put it in terms of Q in and Q out. It doesn't really matter. Uh, or work out, work net out and Q in. Um, since I've already put things in terms of work net out, I think I'm going to do that. So I'm going to put this as work net out over Q in so work net out and then my Q in occurs between 3 and 4 so this is going to be CP times T4 minus T3 and as long as you have defined um, your work net out somewhere and I have right I've defined it right here. As long as you've defined it somewhere in your work, that will be enough for me. Okay. All right, so that's that's good there. And then the very last thing is going to be my thermal efficiency. So yes, I can define it in terms of work net out and Q in, but I can also, if I multiply the top and the bottom by M dot, then what I would have is I would have W dot net out over Q dot in. And so now I've got an equation for that Q dot in. Uh, 
at yeah So you could absolutely do that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you didn't catch that, right, this is your M dot. And so you could say that your, you could say that Q dot N is equal to M dot, which you've defined up there in part A times your CP times T4 minus T3. And either one should get you the exact same thing. Yeah. All right. So it is exactly 12.05. So we will wrap it up here. Like I said, this will be available on the YouTube uh, Thermo 1 or Thermo 2 playlist for Unit 1. Okay. All right. So thank you. You guys have a great weekend. I'll see you next Wednesday. You too. All right. Thank you.